everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Gell. I am the director of the Center uh, for Law and Technology here at Haifa University, and I'm very glad to welcome you to this conference. This is the second day of a joint uh, conference, um, um, the, the Jerusalem Haifa Conference, uh, for which uh, we are very glad. And the conference is organized on our side by both the Center for Law and Technology and the uh, um, Center for Cyber Law and Policy, uh, which is directed by Professor Niva elkin Koren, Professor Taljarski, and uh, Professor Or Dunkelmann from the uh, Computer Science Department. And so the field of uh, law and technology in general, and uh, cyber law in particular, uh, raises a multitude of uh, different and really interesting questions. And these questions are not only theoretical and academic, but they actually affect our lives uh, on a daily basis. So um, the theory is quickly becoming a uh, practice. So while technology brings many benefits, we also know that it also creates a lot of um, uh, significant harms. And indeed, some of the features of these new technologies have uh, increased the extent of some of the harms that we knew uh, from before. Just to give you two examples, one of them is, of course, uh, fake news, something we all know about, uh, we are all affected um, by. Um, the speed of connectivity uh, in the cyber world, as well as the breadth of the um, networks uh, for the dissemination of such news, has increased the effect of fake news and, or, and uh, has um, limited our ability or has created new challenges for our ability to um, deal with uh, such harms. And another example from my area, the um, um, ability or, uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence uh, by algorithms, for example, has created a situation whereby algorithms can uh, um, create, um, can set um, uh, coordinated prices, which are super competitive prices, much higher than we would have paid otherwise, and it creates challenges for our laws because we never assumed that prices would be set in such a way, and then our laws which capture agreements are challenged because if algorithms uh, um, um, uh, determine prices by exhibiting one another and calculating the best price, is that an agreement or not? Okay, so just two examples of how um, uh, things are challenged today. And so much of the focus um, on these harms and how to deal with them um, in the literature and elsewhere has to do with, uh, is centered on direct governmental intervention in the market. And that can be done by laws, by regulation, by case law. Um, However, um, these are very limited um, sometimes because of different reasons, because of the ability, the speed um, um, that we can um, uh, apply them, the sophistication, uh, the fact that uh, market players are sometimes one step ahead of the regulator. And then the next question is, can the market solve some of these questions? Um, the market actually can. It can solve some of them technologically. It can solve some of them by applying the existing laws or adding another layer of application of governmental uh, uh, laws. And this is exactly what we wanted to focus on uh, in these two days. Um, so there are all kinds of technological solutions. Just to give you one that I, I, I think is uh, really interesting, um, has to do with the um, ability to collect and use our personal data. So uh, what we see, uh, some of the technological solutions have to do with um, uh, um, uh, uh, the um, sorry databases which are controlled by users rather than by suppliers. So I think a neat example here is uh, the um, my data. Um, Endeavor in the UK, which attempts to collect the data um, uh, of the data uh, subject and um, then uh, enable all interactions through that database in order to give the data subject more control. So this is just one example of what's going on in, the, in, in this world, which I think is uh, fascinating. So to discuss these issues and, and more, we have a superb cadre of um, academics. And um, I wish you all uh, an enjoyable day. 
which to an academic, enjoyable, means that your mind at the end of the day will buzz with new ideas and you will carry what you have heard today for days to come. Okay? So, um, 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 I would, um, so what I would like to do is um, invite uh, one of our um, um, partners in crime, <laughs> Um, uh, Dr. Inan Lichterman. Inan is the manager of the R&D uh, and Technologies Strategy and Capacity Building Unit at the National Cyber Directorate at the Prime Minister's Office. He has an indis indisciplinary uh, experience in cybersecurity issues from an engagement with major organizations on applied cybersecurity techniques and examination and implementation of top-notch cybersecurity at those organizations to conducting analysis of the effect of cybersecurity on our daily life. In his former position, Inan served 12 years at the cybersecurity unit of the Israeli Security Agency in various roles. He holds a BA in computer science, a master's of business administration, and CISO and CISSP certificates. Inan, floor is yours. Thank you, Michal, and thank you all for the opportunity to come to hear and to listen. Beside of my day job in the INCD, the Israel National Cyber Directorate, I'm an amateur photo photographer. When you learn photography, one of the first things you learn is the basic or the most important thing in photography is a 20 centimeter behind the camera, where your mind is, where you think about. INCD, Israel National Cyber Directorate, behind its role in protecting the civil area of Israel from cyber attacks, has a role, governmental uh, judgment to, to role, on how to, uh, to open and to bring more academic and more academic and more and, and more other things to Israel in order to build Israel as a, as a good way in, in cyber security. Part of my role is to roll around from our from, with our all uh, research centers. Yesterday, I was in one of them, more technologies one. I must say here in Haifa in the Technion. So I wasn't in, in Jerusalem. I had to be, to be there. And it was fascinating. Fascinating with technologies. Fascinating with open technologies with great mind and great ideas and new ideas. But when I drove from there to my home, I think about it. There is a great technology, a great opportunity. But do we know how to deal with them? Do we know what to do with them? and how they, they cooperate, in, co cooperate in our life. And I imagine you, learn new technology, but teach us, as lawyers, how to use them, how to use them correctly. Thank you. sit down, um, uh, but let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Asaf Lubin. Uh, I'm an affiliate at Berkman Line Center for Internet Society um, and uh, a visiting fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School um, and also a researcher at the Federal Cybersecurity Research Center at the University of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, and it's a great honor to have the first session of the day be about a topic as invigorating, as I would argue, uh, uh, cyber insurance. And really, the key goal for today is to get you to come out of this process thinking that insurance is actually a sexy topic. 
Uh, and so we'll see if we're able to do just that. Um, I have a unique role today as I'm wearing two hats, both as a moderator and as a speaker. Uh, and so I'll spend uh, my first few minutes moderating this panel, uh, both kind of setting the scene of what we'll be talking about and introducing uh, the two speakers to my right. Um, then let them introduce the topics that they've been discussing. Uh, and then I'll, I'll say a few words of my own, maybe ask a couple questions, and then open it up for you uh, 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 for a QA. and uh, a So we're talking about cyber insurance. And I have no idea how many people in the room have even heard of the concept before. And so I thought it might be useful to at least set the scene about what cyber insurance really is. So cyber insurance is a risk management technique by which privacy and network vulnerability risks are transferred to an insurance company in return to a fee, the insurance premium. As with all lines of insurance, cyber coverage uh, covers both first and third party harms. Coverage for first party harms could include, for example, loss of revenue from network business interruptions, data restoration costs, and post-incident forensic investigations. Coverage for third party harms will center around liabilities for breach of personal information transmission of malicious code, or statutory fines and penalties triggered by violations of data protection regulations. Now, the global cyber insurance uh, industry is booming, okay? Uh, in 2019, it had a market size of between four and seven billion dollars worldwide. I'm saying between because there's no accurate estimates out there. There's been only estimates being provided by the very insurance companies who are, who are running this business. Uh, Nonetheless, according to some researchers, it is likely to grow to more than 20 billion by 2025. The US currently controls the lion's share of this market, accounting for approximately 90% of all gross written premiums written worldwide. And that is another reason for potential growth for this industry as it expands beyond the boundaries of the United States. Nonetheless, the rush of insurers to cyber, insurer, to cyber insurance might be nothing more than a gold rush. The European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, or EOPA for short, concluded in a recent report that insurers were, quote, broadening coverage terms and conditions in an attempt to sell more policies, all due to increasing competition and a limited understanding of the risks. Warren Buffett was even more discouraging, suggesting recently that if anyone said they knew what they were doing when writing cyber policies, they were, quote, kidding themselves. So in the wake of this, um, uh, the um, Israeli National Cyber Directorate, uh, together with the Federal Cybersecurity Research at the Hebrew University, partnered with two additional partners, Carnegie and Yulit, uh, to bring together a group of scholars over the last two days to Jerusalem. And these scholars come from across different fields. They include reinsurers and insurers. They include people from industry, uh, modeling startups and quantification of cyber risk startups. Uh, they include academics, um, they include people who work in the InfoSec community, and they include a lot of representatives of government, not, not just from Israel, but from around the world, with the goal, the set goal, of trying to turn Israel into a cyber insurance regulation better site, with the idea that Israel might in the future be able to transfer to the world not only its ideas about how to do better cybersecurity, but how to do better cyber risk management. Um, which is a very lofty goal and a very interesting one. And so um, uh, in this spirit, two speakers who are also part of that conference are with us today. Uh, and what we're hoping to do is to continue that conversation that we started two days ago. Now, I'll just mention one thing from that conversation. So one of the people who kind of played a massive role in, in uh, coordinating the discussions is Ellie Levitt. Ellie uh, ran, um, uh, 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 is currently with the Carnegie Foundation as a senior fellow, but he used to uh, run the Israeli um, uh, uh, nuclear, um, uh, I'll give you the exact title, the Deputy Director General for Policy in, at the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission, um, which brings a lot of insights about risks of surrounding nuclear. Um, and he summarized our discussions over the last two days with what he called the Ten Commandments. Uh, and in the spirits of thou shall not, these Ten Commandments all start with the word, word no. Uh, and what you try to do is, let me tell you what the cyber insurance looks like uh, with these ten things. So I'm, I'm, I'm using his words, those are not mine, but they're actually great. So he said, A, no state can do it alone. Cyber insurance will require the involvement of many, many states. 
No one entity in any state can do it alone. It will require the collaboration of multiple governmental entities across the country. No one company can go about doing this alone. So the cyber insurance industry cannot be the sole regulator um, uh, of this space, nor is the InfoSec community. No, the US would not lead the charge around this stuff, in part because the US uh, will be very slow in introducing any immediate regulation of this space. Uh, no standards for information sharing or for calculating risk are, exactly, are, are available to us out there at the current time, nor is there clarity around the specifics of each of these standards. There's no clear platform through which we can take it to the next level. Which international forum will we go to to begin discussing how to regulate the cyber insurance industry? Would it be the OECD? Would it be uh, the World Economic Forum? Would it be somewhere else? There's no one clear answer to where we should go in regulating this space. Um, um, no single academic discipline can deal with this problem on its own. This is a problem that will involve law, it will involve tech and computer science, it will involve international affairs, it will involve philosophy. It's a cross-field uh, interdisciplinary space. There are no norms uh, of behavior that are out there to bind us. Um, um, uh, uh, think about the way governments have been handling cybersecurity threats, uh, and in part expanding this, this the inter the intergovernmental um, uh, uh, kind of cold war ish cold war ish sorry um, um, cyber war, um, and in that regard, with lack of norms to guide us, can we even imagine how to manage the risk in the context of cyber warfare? Um, and it's not, it's not one area that would be looked at from a security perspective alone. alone. While we look at security perspective, we need to also look at um, quality assurance and human rights and so on and so forth. So with those 10 commandments in mind, uh, I will now uh, leave it to my two colleagues to my right uh, 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 to speak more about their perspectives around um, research of cyber insurance. And let me first just introduce them briefly. So to my immediate right is Dr. Shao Wang, is a professor of actuarial science in the Division of Banking and Finance at the Nanyang Business School in Singapore and the director of the school's Insurance Risk and Finance Research Center, or IRFRC. And to his right is Andrew Grodo, who is a William J. Perry International Security Fellow at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute, Director of Program on Geopolitics, Technology, and Governance at Stanford Cyber, Secur Cyber Policy Center, and a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Before Standard Stanford, he was a Senior Director for Cyber Policy on the National Security Council at the White House. Each of them will take about 15 minutes to talk more about cyber insurance, uh, and we'll take it from them. Thank you, Peso of uh, <laughs> uh, It's an honor to be here. Uh, actually, we just want to have a conversation. I uh, want everybody to be more relaxed. Uh, and it's going to be an important topic. Actually, I don't want to take it lightly because in the past a day and a half, I, were, I was overwhelmed by um, the the, the, the workshop we had, um, I was so impressed uh, by, firstly, by Israel. Uh, incredible uh, land and people, lots of talent. This is the center of cyber uh, IT and cyber security talents. And also impressed by the universities, the history, how many, how many great uh, um, you know, work, you know, um, Nobel Prize winners, etc. So, um, this is uh, actually we're living in uh, exciting times, and uh, as I just mentioned, the cybersecurity is a global challenge. It's, uh, every country, every sector is facing this challenge and need to come to grips how to manage cyber risk. And in the, for this conference, how to protect the victims, right? I mean, um, so there's a business element. There's also public responsibility element. So uh, just in that context, I want to mention about, you know, come to cyber insurance because we're dealing with a new risk. And 
had multiple dimensions, and many countries actually came up with, you know, cybersecurity standard, the NIST framework, etc. There are many uh, well-published reports what organizations should do, but very little action. Very little. Very few companies actually are doing it. So then the country leaders, uh, including the U.S. Uh, and other countries, uh, for me, I came from Singapore, really looking for cyber insurance at the industry, perhaps to help really to, to you know, turn a standard into action. So organizations can take action so we can do better uh, cyber risk management and protect the, uh, the, the community, the victims. Um, so that's really the context. So I, with that, I don't want really to get too detailed into, you know, cyber insurance. Um, so I have a few points I want to highlight, and later on we'll have a conversation because Andrew um, also, I mean, the very experienced from the uh, cyber uh, security law uh, aspect. Um, so I want to start with some um, maybe to some concrete story. Have you, I'll just maybe ask the audience, have, uh, have you heard about Modelay's Sue Zurich, that case? If you do, would you raise hand? Oh, not many. So this is a famous case. Uh, Modelay's is a US food company, uh, you know, produce many candy brands, including Oreo. Um, and Modelays uh, suffered big losses uh, from uh, not Petra uh, malware. That was 2017. And then uh, he had thought, well, uh, Modelays said, well, we have, cyber, uh, we have insurance with Zurich insurance. So they filed an insurance claim for, um, for a large sum. And then Zurich said, wait a minute. Uh, we never, well, let's look at our contract, contract law. Contract law says that, well, there's exclusion. Of that's word exclusion. Well, why word exclusion? Because the, the not Petro was origin from Ukraine and was interpreted as like a Russia against Ukraine and how that got started. And that was the kind of the reason for Zurich Insurance to refuse to pay. And then there's a lawsuit, uh, Modelay's uh, sued Zurich for 100 million US dollars. That's about 300 million uh, shackle, right? So it's still not settled yet, right? Um, and that's why I think, uh, that's, I think I recognize uh, Ali Levi um, and uh, Ward Hoffman. Actually, they took notice of this and called for urgent government action you know, we got to have a clear cut whether it's covered by insurance or not. You know, such a um, real case still uh, not settled. So, um, speaking of um, cyber insurance, there's, I just want to highlight some of the issues related to law. Um, because of the you know, car insurance, home insurance, well tested. Now this with this new cyber <laughs> risk added, uh, depending on your buyer or seller, you have different interpretations. So in the US, it's up to the court to decide. And there's uh, some uh, scientific study. The court has not been coherent, depending on which court you go to, depend, you know, depending on the time, um, the jury, all that. So. Um, so there's a confusion. What actually are covered by cyber insurance? It's, so that's actually a hindrance for cyber insurance transaction, the risk transfer. Um, that's one uh, aspect I want to highlight. Um, I think maybe, yes, you mentioned ASAP about, that was you, if I remember correctly. Anyway, I'll give credit to you. <laughs> um, there's some fundamental issues. For example, ransomware. Should the insurance cover, cover ransomware? Because if the insurance pays ransomware, 
would I encourage the hackers to do more? Right? But if, on the other hand, if uh, for organization, you know, oh, they are hit by ransomware, they need to pay by Bitcoin, they don't know how to do it. Well, we, I, we bought insurance, so get us back to work. We don't want to deal with it. The insurance help us to deal with it, minimize our business loss. That's totally legitimate. But where do you, where do you draw the line? It needs some algorithm to help decide whether it's, whether it's uh, okay to do that. Uh, related questions are regulatory fine. Mm -hmm. Because data privacy, protect consumer data is very much, you know, on the minds of governments, protect their citizens. Um, and now there's a significant regulatory fine. You heard about GDPR up to 4% of global revenue. That's huge in terms of potential maximum fine. Then the question, should insurance pay regulatory fine? And then there is a, there's a question here because what if the organization had done everything they could to kind of do care? But you know, there's unknown unknown. There's things beyond their control. Then perhaps, you know, it makes sense for, for insurance to pay regulatory fine. But if the organization just didn't pay any attention, didn't pay due care, um, then why should the insurance company pay the regulatory fine? You know, again, you need some algorithm. So coming back, I see in the cyber world, definitely there is a risk transfer, need for risk transfer. Um, and so the legal aspect is murky. So we need actually legal professionals to, to help us. For example, if you have a, a cyber insurance contract, you always go to court, let the court decide, most money will go to, you know, the legal process. So that's not very efficient, right? So I believe that there is a need for data-driven, algorithm-driven, my sort of arbitration. If the law, the law professionals come together, let's have an efficient way to settle disputes. Let's take the facts together. We have an algorithm. We can calculate who should pay what. Wouldn't that be nice? I hope you know the people in this room can help with that. <laughs> so that's kind of my first. Uh, Part. I will come back to this. Uh, I need to look at my time. Uh, I want actually now to just switch a little bit in terms of protecting the population uh, from online crime. There is a, um, I just give two maybe two, two stories. One is that uh, JP Morgan had a big data breach. They lost uh, so many customers, multi multi millions uh, of consumers account, uh, financial information uh, was stolen. And JP Morgan said, well, we're okay, we're a big bank. Um, but I heard that later on, some victims, like only two or three years later, they were victims of financial fraud. Got phone calls because they got their information and uh, pretending from a bank and uh, just scammed lots of money out of them. You know, it's the victim, you know, not only financial loss, emotional, you know, um, suffering. And somehow the big organizations, they say, well, yeah, we had a breach, but there's no problem. <laughs> they basically, they got away from the responsibility protecting their customers, like even five, two or three years down the road. Another example, a uh, real life case, so that uh, this cyber insurance has not been helping with this, but I think that this for this uh, group, it's very relevant. Let's say it's a customer who had an account with JP Morgan, you know, their uh, ID was stolen. And then there's a group in Hong Kong. By the way, Hong Kong is a safe haven for online crime. I'll come back to this. and. 
they were kind of committed this fraud, you know, the thousand victims report to FBI, but FBI just said, okay, take a record, okay, who suffered a loss, you know, but didn't do anything. And so who are actually, so here's a legal, uh, a question for the uh, legal professionals. Why Hong Kong became a safe haven? You have criminals, organized crime, they are there protected by the current law. They are protected. They are kind of shielded. There's no international organization can go there, you know, bring, you know, bring them to justice. They are doing this every day to, you know, to go after individuals, go after organizations. It's really business emo compromise, you know, where transfer. So I talked to, in the Singapore, I talked to uh, Interpol. Mm -hmm. um, they told me that, well, we are so fragmented in terms of different, uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions. It's hard for us actually to mobilize coordination among uh, law uh, enforcement. Uh, so U.S. government knows, in the FBI website, you can openly say, we know there's a group from Hong Kong, they do this, but why the international community cannot come to terms that how, wh why don't we organize a business, more like a private sector uh, being enabled to go after criminals? Go, if they take, have a, where, where money, uh, where transfer fraud, can we go after, chase money, we can get money back. There's also a business case. So that's, uh, I, I think there's a lot of real work can be done. Um, finally, uh, one more uh, kind of the biggest point I want to make, and then we'll turn to Andy because we want to have some uh, interaction. The biggest point I want to make come back here. We're here in Israel. I have witnessed the amazing talent in cybersecurity and amazing intellectual property at the top universities with history, um, with a kind of spirit of innovation. Israel has one of the best capacity in terms of technology cybersecurity. Now I see Israel is trying to turn that into productivity for the country. I think that's really encouraging. Um, I think with your capability of innovation, you can innovate in designing financial contracts, innovative uh, cyber insurance, innovative cyber insurance. You don't have to follow the existing ones, the risk management uh, solutions. However, we also need the legal professionals coming together, the scholars and the professional lawyers coming together, bring your intellectual capital, your knowledge of different legal systems, how to make this happen, to help this new risk management industry to be, you know, to, to grow so that it's, it's really kind of a, to help a cyber risk management. I think actually it's very much needed. If you don't help, there's a big missing piece. So that's kind of my uh, biggest point I want to make. I, w I should stop now and uh, yeah. we'll turn yeah. to the... Uh, say, uh, so, uh, Sean did a great job kind of laying both the ethical dilemmas and legal challenges that are facing any discussion about cyber insurance. I personally have very strong views around whether or not cyber insurance should cover ransomware or uh, GDPR violations and so on. And I, but I reserve my, I will say them, but I will just reserve my rights till after Andrew speaks. So take it away, Andrew. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, so I want to pick up on. Um, on, the, on, on a theme that I think Sean did a really good job teasing out, which is that you know insurance is ultimately about who pays when something goes wrong, whether you know through through an act of, of of malicious action by a person or just some accident caused by nature or bad luck or whatever. So it really boils down to who pays when 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 people or organizations are harmed. 
and you know who the question of who pays shapes um, how much an actor is willing to invest in risk mitigation. Uh, if I don't have to pay for a harm that my actions cause, I have no incentive to invest in mitigating that harm. In contrast, if I bear the cost of, of my actions, then I have some stronger incentive to try to, to, try to uh, um, uh, reduce, uh, invest more uh, in, in risk mitigation. Uh, in cyber risk management, uh, as is true in any risk management domain, whether it's financial risk, privacy risk, you name it, there, there are basically four strategies for risk mitigation. What, what, what I want to do is locate insurance in these strategies, kind of provide some context for how this fits into how someone like me who, who thinks about these problems from a, you know, in terms of how uh, private um, law, private incentives shape um, uh, public policy and affect um, the public interest. So the first strategy is an actor can try to avoid risk. Now, in principle, that's hard to do um, because, uh, I mean, it's short of, in, at least in, in the cyber context, unplugging your, your computer and putting it in a vault somewhere, like it, you, you can't really avoid risk, uh, so I won't dwell too much on that. Um, an actor can try to reduce risk uh, by uh, investing in, in, in defenses, in um, you know, uh, not collecting data that they don't need uh, to as a way of, of reducing uh, their exposure to uh, privacy issues. Um, they can transfer risk, um, and that that's where insurance comes in. Insurance is about transferring risk to a third party. Um, uh, but so are things like uh, software licensing. Uh, you know, if you, if you have an iPhone and you open up your settings, you go to general, go to the legal regulatory tab and hit and push on license, you'll see, and I'll pick on Apple, uh, but all companies do this, you'll see you know, the, 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 the software license uh, will say, uh, essentially, you know, we disclaim all warranties over this product. Um, you accept this as is, and if uh, your phone causes you harm, we're not responsible. Right? Um, so that's another way of transferring risk. And then, and then last but not least, um, since um, at the end of the day, it's, it's typically impossible to um, transfer or reduce all risk to zero, um, an, an actor uh, can monitor and, and manage uh, residual risk. Um, and so, so insurance fits within that, that, that transfer of risk. And the reason why you see a lot of, of interest among policymakers in Israel, uh, in the United States, and elsewhere in insurance is because an insurance company is not going to want to accept that risk unless it has some level of confidence that the, uh, the insured, the would-be insured, has tried to reduce risk in those other three domains, avoid risk, reduce risk, and monitor and manage residual risk. Because at the end of the day, if the insurer does not perform those functions appropriately and with diligence, then the insurance company's on the hook uh, to, uh, to pay uh, um, for losses. Uh, and so, so the, 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 the reason why, again, why you see so much interest in, in, in public policy in, um, in, in, in insurance is this idea that insurance could drive more effective risk management by, by organizations, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, and you know, there, there's historical precedent for this thinking. Um, if you know, uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with with, with the U.S. Um, U.S. aspects of U.S. legal history than I am with Israel. But in the U.S., at least, um, you know, the insurance industry um, had a huge impact on things like building uh, building safety. Right, where um, you know, insurance companies would say, "Well, you know, we we're not going to insure this building against fire." Uh, and flood unless you have sprinklers and a sump pump, right? And so you can see that you know, what, what then happens is buildings become safer as a result of insurance, uh, you know, essentially driving uh, more effective um, uh, risk investment, um, risk mitigation investments on the part of, of building owners. Um, now, you know, there are a bunch of problems that come up um, when it comes to cyber insurance specifically, and I, I want to walk you through a few of them. Um, one of the, the big problems, and this, this is not just unique to insurance, I think it's, it's a problem in uh, cyber policy more generally, is a, a real challenge around identifying where a private organization's responsibility to mitigate against a risk ends and the, and the government's begins. And so, you know, the, 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 the analogy or the sort of the thought experiment I like to use is um, in the United States, we would never expect uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, the, the utility that serves uh, me in the Bay Area, 
uh, to defend itself against a North Korean ballistic missile, right? That, that, that's not the utility, utility can't do that. that that's the government's job. Um, when it comes to a cyber attack by North Korea, it's, it's a little more complicated, right? Because, okay, so, you know, if, if North Korea were to launch the cyber equivalent of a ballistic missile, uh, you know, and, and okay, so it's, and so on some level, it's, it's not appropriate or fair to expect a private organization to defend itself against a well-resourced, um, sophisticated nation state with, with all sorts of, of operational, legal, and technical advantages. Um, on the other hand, if North Korea, in this case, um, exploited the cyber equivalent of opening the front door and going in with a baseball bat, we would say, no, I mean, you know, the, the, the company was complicit in some way. I mean, it, it's still a victim, right? Uh, there's still a national security nexus, but we wouldn't say, I, I think, that the company is wholly absolved of any responsibility for, for what happened. We would ask questions like, okay, wow, like, why did you leave the front door open, right? You know, um, why were your systems so fragile um, that it took one actor to go in with the base with the cyber equivalent of a baseball bat and cause catastrophic damage? Um, and so, you know, in these cases, you know, and this is why you see, you know, in, 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 in Sean's example of the Mondelez case um, of, of, you know, the Russian attack against Ukraine uh, using uh, malware, it's become known as NotPetya, um, which then spread worldwide, causing some of these, these, these problems. Because, you know, it's, it's on, on some level, I mean, yeah, of course, you know, you, I mean, Russia is a sophisticated, well-resourced, highly capable threat actor. Um, you know, we would never expect Mondelez to defend itself against, you know, a, a Russian military, conventional military assault. So why should we expect it to defend itself against um, a, a Russian, you know, cyber attack, even if it was collateral damage? So, you know, this, 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 this question of insurance is wrapped up in much bigger questions around um, where, where the government's uh, responsibility uh, begins and the private sector's ends in, in when it comes to cyber defense. And... A further complication here is that um, being able to even even sort of begin to answer that question requires uh, some fidelity over the identity of the perpetrator, right? Because, and the problem in cyber is that unlike a ballistic missile, which you know you can track with radar and, and has sort of a virtual return address, um, you know cyber attacks um, you know are are more obscure, and adversaries purposefully try to hide their um, their uh, their tracks and, and avoid attribution and so um, you know it, it, this this question gets even more complicated when 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 an adversary has been successful in hiding its hand and um, and so you know to the extent that we, we, we have this intuition that the identity of the perpetrator matters in terms of assigning legal liability and, and overall responsibility ethically or, or what have you. That depends on being able to identify the identity, the, the, you know, of, of the actor, which which may be challenging in um, in cyber. Um, there's a um, when it comes to insurance, uh, more specifically, so as I said, I mean, the, the reason why um, you see such interest in the Israeli government and U.S. government elsewhere in cyber insurance is that this idea that it can drive more private investment in risk mitigation. And, and you know, essentially, there, 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 there's sort of two dimensions to this. Like there's a demand issue. Does is the private sector actually demanding um, cyber insurance? And then a supply issue. You know, d d is the is the insurance industry um, capable of you know providing coverage that um, is is e efficient and, and, and optimal and, and notwithstanding Warren Buffett's mm -hmm. I think apt mm -hmm. comments. On the demand side. You know, so I, I've been I've been involved in uh, cyber policy for you know ten years, and I, I've been involved in basically every major policy debate in the United States around cyber issues. Um, and yeah, you know, I could say on the one hand, you know, the United States, I think this is true of Israel as well. Overall awareness among the private sector uh, and the need to manage and mitigate cyber risks has is you know way higher today than it was ten years ago. Uh, but it's still uh, not anywhere close to where it needs to be, not least of which is because uh, organizations um, have to invest resources in this, and uh, cyber mitigating cyber risk competes with every other um, you know, uh, business imperative that, that an organization faces. And I'll give you one anecdote for why this, why this turned out to be really hard for a lot of organizations. In my research, I, I talked to a lot, of, a lot of companies about how they approach managing cyber risk, and I, I had a conversation with with the CISO at a very large uh, tech company with uh, 
you know, real uh, sophisticated uh, data analytics board that's committed to managing cyber risk. And he told me that, you know, when, when he goes in to, uh, you know, to, to brief the board and the CEO on their cyber posture, um, the, you know, and, 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 and compete for resources, um, you know, going before him will be, you know, someone from one of the business units who will go in with a, a business case with market, hard market research, some technology, um, some historical uh, precedent within the company for this sort of thing, uh, hard numbers, uh, you know, estimates on return on investment that, that are grounded in, in empirics. And then he would go in with a chart that's color-coded red, yellow, and green in terms of how, how where, where the organization is in, in managing certain aspects of cyber risk. So that, 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 I mean, there, there's just a real, there's a data problem here, uh, which gets me to the next point, which is that insur insurance has the same, the same data issue. Um, and one of the arguments that you see on the supply side for why um, you see problems like this Mondelez case, but just putting aside the, the, the war exclusion issue for a moment, is um, you know, the a difficulty building a, an actuarial model for, for cyber risk. Uh, there are a lot of, of, of reasons why it's hard, um, and we could, we could talk more about that in, in q and can get pretty, mm -hmm. quite technical. <laughs> um, but, I mean, suffice it to say, the more data you have in your model, the more confidence um, you can have in, in terms of being able to make a bet, and insurance companies are essentially in the business of making bets that, um, you know, that you have, that you'll be able to cover losses um, in an appropriate way. Um, now, when it comes to gathering more data, most of the headwinds in public policy are against companies mm. sharing more data with each other and with, um, with, with insurance companies, with other companies, with, even with governments. Uh, you know, uh, there are also business drivers that, that create real disincentives for sharing data. So the, I'll, I'll start with the business incentives. So, you know, most companies who collect a lot of data view their data as an asset, right? And so uh, they need to see a return on investment in sharing that data, whether that's with an insurance authority, whether it's with other companies in order for them to feel like it's worth their while. So there's a business question to get over at the threshold, right, in terms of, of, of trying to build a data ecosystem to, to generate um, you know, more, uh, more robust cyber insurance offerings. Then in public policy, you know, the trend line you know, for the last you know, five years is to restrict companies' ability to collect, share, tr transfer data with, with each other and, and with governments. Uh, so you know, obviously, you know, GDPR in Europe is, is, is one example, uh, the General Data Privacy Regulation. Um, but it's not the only, you know, Europe is not the only uh, actor in this game. Um, in California, um, the California state legislature passed a very tough privacy law last year that goes into effect next year. Uh, mm -hmm. China um, has a, a law called the Cybersecurity Act that, that um, imposes real restrictions on the sharing of data. This all covers PII. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, non-PII is also really important here because uh, a lot of, a lot a lot of the, the risk um, that uh, I see uh, becoming more prominent is, uh, has to do with machine-to-machine -machine communication, with industrial um, Internet of Things capabilities, where um, you know, there's not really private information. It's, 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 um, it's essentially machine data. And even there, um, you know, the headwinds are, are uh, um, crosswise at best. Um, and so, uh, the European Commission issued a directive um, earlier this year on uh, the free flow of non-personal information that um, I think uh, at best uh, was, it was intended, I think, to try to clarify um, the relationship between non-PII and, and, and GDPR, but it's had, the, it's had some unfortunate effects, not least of which is confusing people <coughs> over, okay, what, what happens if I have blended data? Do I have to separate the data? Uh, so there's just there's a real uh, a problem there. Um, China um, just last month um, issued a, a, a draft uh, cybersecurity threat information publication management measure, uh, which is essentially a, a, a proposed framework for how um, ch organizations in China, um, including individual researchers, uh, can can share information about cyber threats or not. And uh, the approach the Chinese have taken is to basically say. Uh, the default is you can't share threat information. You've got to either go get government permission first, or uh, take your chances that we may come after you later. Um, so you know, so this this data question, there there's a lot of headwinds. And so for me, I'm 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 fairly pessimistic about um, cyber insurance for, for for that reason. Then the, 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 I think the, the the point I want to close with is that 
um, you know, put, putting my, you know, my, my public policy hat back on, uh, even if we assume that, um, that private organizations invested the optimal amount in managing cyber risk, um, there's still an open question as to whether that level of investment is sufficient to meet the public interest in some higher level mm. of security, particularly given all the negative externalities and, and, mm. and that, that a breach affecting, say, the power sector could have on, on, on other aspects of the economy. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that is, a, that is a, a question that, that we, at least in the U.S., have wrestled with and, uh, you know, gets wrapped up in, uh, in, in, in politics pretty quickly because you get into questions of, of regulatory policy mm -hmm. and the role of the government, which, you know, um, is, is, if you, you know, follow U.S. politics is a, is a real hard cleavage in uh, U.S. political debate. So why don't I stop there and I'll, I'll turn it back to Asaf. <coughs> So thank you so much, Andrew. Um, in 2012, Omri Ben Shahar publishes an article that has become the way we think about the role of insurance in today's economy. And that article is called Outsourcing Regulation. What Omri Ben Shahar says in that article is that insurers can outperform regulators in introducing safety measures and introducing um, um, policies that would better the operations of businesses. And, and you heard a little bit of this in Andrew's remarks. And what um, uh, I think you got a sense of from the comments that were raised by, by, by the two speakers up until now is that it could be the case that even if what Omri Ben Shahar argued in 2012 is the case, is simply not true in the cyber risk context. And I would try to just summarize what they said uh, by giving you what I consider to be the three most systematic uh, hindrances on the way cyber insurance operates. The first is informational asymmetries and informational gaps. And we've been to have based so much of his analysis on the idea that insurers might be the best collectors and disseminators of knowledge and information around security. And the assumption simply is not there that cyber insurers are those who have that data. And that's both because the security data is held by both the victims who will not share that information for reputational harm, and the government, intelligence agencies, who will not share that information for security reasons. And also, there's the problem that only five of the biggest insurers control more than 70% of the shares of the market. So five insurers are controlling all of the claims data and it is the claims data, which they consider proprietary knowledge, which is where we develop models and actuarial analysis out of. And so the ability for this market to mature in a, in a, in a good way is hindered by the, fake that only, by the fact that only a few actors, predominantly a few reinsurers, are controlling much of the data that is being developed. And so you will find in the literature all kinds of suggestions about information depositories, um, but then the question is, who controls this data? How do you aggregate information? What are the privacy risks, uh, reputational risks? Who will want to share that information with government or third party? Um, and we had some of those conversations during the last two days. In addition to that, and that's still within that first category of problem, are the way insurers underwrite. And so underwriting in the insurance industry has been traditionally based on uh, questionnaires as the first way by which I analyze this, the risks that a company has. Now in the cyber insurance context, I, I've had the privilege of reading more than 200 of these questionnaires. Um, uh, it, the ability to translate um, cybersecurity standards and understandings into a set of yes or no questions is, is far from ideal. So here's one common example of a question from a cyber insurance questionnaire. Do you have a privacy policy and do you always adhere to it? <laughs> How is that a question that serves you in your ability to underwrite the harm? It is only there so you can cop out later from pain because you said, oh, you said that you always adhere to your privacy policy and so we will not pain it. Um, so that's the first problem, informational asymmetries and gaps. The second challenge is aggregated risks. And what is unique about cybersecurity as opposed to some of the other risks out there is that cyber risk is particularly prone to aggregated concerns. So think of insurance for natural disasters. A particular geographical region might be prone to hurricanes or earthquakes or flooding, and an insurer could thus diversify its portfolio by offering coverage across geographical lines in areas that are less likely to suffer an insurable event. Cyber attacks, however, are blind to geographical borders. The interconnectivity that is part and parcel of our digital economy 
makes mega cyber catastrophes a real possibility. And you have, we have already witnessed it in the examples mentioned in Notpedia and WannaCry. Moreover, monopolies in the, land, in the tech landscape have forced us to rely on only a few operating systems, online platforms, services, devices, and cloud providers. And as a result, we are all subject to the same common vulnerabilities. Exploiting one of us is like exploiting all of us. So that's the second problem with cyber insurance is just aggregated risk. And the last systemic challenge to cyber insurance that was already mentioned are classification problems. And you saw this perfectly in the Mondelez v. Zurich case. The idea that we don't have a one-size-fit-all definition of what is warfare for the warlike traditional exclusion, what is warfare in cyberspace, what is terrorism in cyberspace, and yet we introduce exclusionary language that is supposed to prevent the insurer from coverage without us to being able to define what are the terms of those contracts. Um, creating um, an instability in the market and confusion on both the part of the policyholder and the policy. But in addition to all of these, because all of these are uh, significantly discussed in the literature, in part because the literature is all driven through by the lens of economic efficiency, which is so common to how we think about insurance. Does it work or does it not work? But what I am interested in, and over the last year and a half I've been doing research on with the Federman uh, um, Cybersecurity Research Center at Hebrew University, is with looking at the ethical dimensions of cyber insurance rather than the economic dimensions of cyber insurance. And um, this, this, this distinction is one common in the literature. Bach Berliner wrote an article dimension, called Dimensions of Insurability, and he distinguished between actuarial and market-based economic concerns and what he called societal concerns or moral concerns. Um, in fact, in 1971, the late Professor John D. Long wrote a really great book that if you're interested in this topic, I really put to you to read, called Ethics, Morality, and Insurance. Professor Long took the role of a futurist, writing in the pre-information age, Long foresaw, quote, a progressively complex technological environment triggered by advances in computer science that would exert major influences on our way of life and would be foundational in shaping a new morality. The institutional apparatus of insurance, argued Long, would have to align itself with this new morality in order to remain successful in achieving long-range use. Long's public policy approach to insurance law is thus one willing to make certain sacrifices around market freedom and individual business interests to achieve broader moral gains for society. His model recognizes that insurance has a dark side, a potential social cost triggered whenever social benefits do not translate well in terms of private wealth accumulation or whenever private insurance markets stifle public debate, thereby endangering collective social security. And some of the best examples were the one that Sean provided to you. Should insurers cover or not cover ransomware costs? Now you have to understand, it could be economically efficient in the moment for the insurer and the insurer and the insured to pay the ransom to the um, hacker. But in so doing, you're providing financial incentives for a broader criminal enterprise. And so the question thus becomes, do I have as an insurer a broader ethical or moral obligation here? And so um, I actually want to take two more minutes to just talk about this and give you what I think about this specific topic. And so, uh, part of the challenge here is that there is no um, rules in the United States, at least, and to be fair, anywhere around the world, on what to do in the case of a ransomware. There's at best, um, for example, the, the U.S. In, uh, produced in December 2018 an interagency guide, which included the FBI and the NSA and all these entities came together. And here's what they were able to say about ransomware to CISOs. We incentivize you, we, 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 we recommend that you don't pay. We recommend that you notify us. At the end of the day, however, this is a, quote, tough question. And we leave it to you to consider your broader market concerns, your sh shareholders, other needs in deciding whether to pay or not to pay. There's a twofold problem here. The first is that um, 
Uh, what insurers have started doing is that they've removed a requirement that was traditional in ransom and kidnapping policies, those old policies of old, where a CEO of a company was kidnapped in Latin America. Right? <laughs> those old policies demanded that you first notify the FBI before you get any indemnification. Insurers have now removed that requirement. It's no longer to be found in any cyber insurance policy mm -hmm. because they're saying that they're insured don't want that to be there. And if they introduced it, no one would buy their policy. So what we're seeing is a race to the bottom whereby no one notifies the FBI or the Secret Service in the case of a ransomware attack, and the insurers are incentivizing not to notify. Mm. In addition to that, no one is introducing any framework for thinking through the decision to pay or not to pay the ransom, including the entities whose job it is to stop this criminal epidemic, which is the law enforcement agencies. And so the insurer and the insured are only subjected to their own economic reasoning because they're unable to think of broader societal concerns. And so one can articulate a framework that would, um, at first as a best, best practice and later on perhaps as a regulatory regime, compel you to think through a set of considerations prior to payment and making your decisions one rooted better in policy concerns that are broader than just your own economic uh, risks. I, as you can see, I can talk about these stuff for hours, uh, but I will hold off. Um, what I want to see is just to get a temperature in the room and see if, 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 if there are any questions in the audience. If there aren't, I'll ask questions because I have a ton uh, to our speakers. But are there any questions you want to pose uh, to, to any of us? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, my name is Mark Blaser from the Law School in the Netherlands. Um, we are very focused on okay, subject rights and the protection of uh, users and, and data in Europe. Uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of emphasis on cyber insurance and, and this kind of discussion about the role. Uh, there is some suggestion that cyber insurance is actually giving more protection to data subjects than the GDPR requires, and so it could become a significant protection of data subject rights even beyond the law. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, that kind of theory that's being proposed around the other by some academics. I've used that, yeah. Um, <laughs> This ties directly to the question of whether or not we should ensure GDPR fines and penalties. But the reason why... Uh, uh, Sorry, just to, yeah. it's not about ensuring the penalties as much as it is ensuring against breaches, because the GDPR requires technological, technical and organizational measures and technical measures to keep data secure. Right. When, those, when the insurance comes in and requires those organizations to be compliant with GDPR, they're actually asking them to go beyond GDPR compliance to the extent that the insurers know how to interpret the GDPR and introduce regulation on the companies to better protect themselves, to better protect their users uh, from data breaches, I would argue to you then yes, insurance could play a positive role in enforcing and ensuring compliance with GDPR. Um, there's a great article by Ari Weldman. Um, coming up called Privacy's False Promise that I don't know if you've read. But Ari Weldman, what he did is he embedded himself uh, with compliance firms for two years to examine whether or not GDPR compliance is a good tool uh, in ensuring better protection for uh, uh, the rights of, uh, of debt holders. And what he had found in his analysis is no, that the GDPR compliance industry is just introducing an outsourcing to layers of compliance professionals who are interested in a checklisting analysis that is not rooted in this, uh, the, the um, uh, core of protecting people's privacy. Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> and if, if that's the case, the insurers would not be any different here. Insurers are even more prone to operating through questionnaires, mm -hmm. to operating through a checklist mentality of compliance, which I would argue to you might not be of service here. But I do think that this is also directly tied to this discussion about just insurability of GDPR fines, because that too plays a role in how the board and CEOs of a company think about the GDPR. If they see the GDPR as a risk to be transferred, and they transfer that risk to an insurance company, the whole concept of the GDPR is a deterrence mechanism 
in particular in the context of the fines that will be introduced in the case of a breach, in the case that you fail to meet security measures, um, goes away. And so the question of the insurability of the GDPR, which is now pending before the OECD, is a massive question. And what you're seeing is that across the EU member states, there's massive discrepancy around how to interpret that question, with a few countries allowing the insurability of GDPR, many prohibiting it, about 10, and the rest just don't have an answer, so about 18 are silent as to whether or not it's insurable uh, or not. Um, another, just one final point on this, uh, most cyber insurance policies have an exclusion that says, we do not cover you if you don't meet certain um, um, reasonable security measures. And so this prong of reasonable security measures is one open-ended for interpretation. And I think that that too, until that is sufficiently defined, that too would hinder on the ability of the cyber insurance industry to play a positive role in enhancing data rights protections. I'll just add, yeah. I mean, this, you know, that's a good idea. I mean, this, you know, this, this problem that, that Asaf has indicated, I think, fairly is, you know, it, I mean, it's an artifact of, of GDPR's drafting. I mean, it's, it's, it's not exactly the most <laughs> crisp legal document. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm reminded of, of, you know, there's a part of me that's like, okay, what, you know, what do we want companies to do? I mean, is it, is it like that old Bruce Lee movie where, you know, he's like, do it again, but with feeling? Like, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I, I'm, I just, I don't know. I, I think um, that there, there's, and GDPR is, 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 in a way, you know, obviously it's, it's like, you know, sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to, uh, you know, regulation, liability, and, and uh, around, um, around data. But it's, it's also like, um, you know, uh, we don't have a full sense yet of what it means and, and, and maybe, maybe more um, specifically how um, data protection officials uh, across Europe, of which there are many with, you know, different agendas, will interpret it. And, um, and so I, I'm just, you know, I, I mean, G, G, it, makes, it makes GDPR both a really interesting case, but also, a, you know, a, 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 a funny one to look at now, because I still feel like it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like looking at, you know, an impressionist painting up close, you know, like we, we're still like, you know, mm. up close, we have to kind of begin to get some distance from it to really understand, um, you know, what, what, it, what it portends um, for insurance and, and, and beyond. Um. This is fascinating. Thank you so much. And, um, I would uh, um, push a bit more about uh, the issue of how different cybersecurity is, uh, cyber uh, insurance is, than other uh, types of insurance. Because it's actually made three very good points. But I was wondering, I mean, whether there are additional uh, issues here, and one which I would relate maybe to AI, which you mentioned. Uh, maybe we cannot even think about the extent. I mean, maybe there's a problem of even thinking, because AI is driving a lot of these uh, harms. So you have to expect them. Can you really expect them in such an industry and then ensure them efficiently? Hmm. So, I mean, that would be one thing that I'm thinking about. The other has to do with the fact that um, of the secrecy that, again, you mentioned, uh, that the consumer itself uh, of the insurance, the ins insurer, does not want anybody to know. So I'm wondering whether there are more issues that make cyber insurance different than other types of insurance. Go ahead and start. Yeah, you can get started. Okay. Uh, so uh, so I, while I share some of these concerns, at the same time I want to say that uh, I, I don't automatically join the bandwagon of saying we should uh, throw the old, this is so common also in broader law and tech the, the literature. This is a new problem, let's talk about the, like, the new solutions. Actually, I, I, I completely agree, and, but there are old policies that also introduce some of these challenges. So terrorism insurance, which has been with us to a significant state, extent post 9-11, uh, but has been in, with us even before then, introduces many of those similar challenges. How do we expect the harm? How do we underwrite for the harm? The security challenges around releasing information and the informational gap in the symmetries. And in fact, in 2006, uh, I forget who wrote it, but there's a great article called Unknown Unknowns, which suggests that in terrorism insurance is a joke and should end um, in, in, in much in a similar way that some have suggested that cyber insurance should end uh, for the same kind of reason. 
I would argue to you that instead, what it indicates, those types of scenarios where insurers cannot operate alone, like in the case of fire insurance or auto insurance, um, where they have decades of history in doing this and model the risk, in the context of these types of risks, which are directly dependent on public-private partnerships, like terrorism, like cyber, there is a need for these kind of collaboration that will be introduced through governmental regulation. So I'm not suggesting that we throw the baby with the bathwater. I'm suggesting that anyone who thought in government that you can just let the market run its course and everything will work out, that is not going to happen in the cyber insurance industry. And so what is so interesting about Israel is Israel's commitment now to be one of the first countries on the planet that will introduce a whole comprehensive framework that is now being supported. Moshe, Moshe Bareket, who is the regulator of the, cyber insur of the insurance industry in Israel, was part of the discussions of the last two years, and he has committed himself to introducing regulation of the, of the nascent, basically non-existent cyber insurance market in Israel in an attempt to A, make it grow and become a reality, and B, make it grow and become efficient. And so this move in Israel is really unique and might be a model for other countries to adopt in light of the fact that cyber insurance is one of those areas that require this kind of regulation. Yeah. I would uh, add to Aesop's uh, remarks. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, traditional insurance, like life insurance, car insurance, they're pretty stable. You know, you can analyze using actuarial analysis, myself as an actuary, um, so I know that. But the cyber insurance is different. It's dynamic, it's moving very fast. That's why the insurance industry is having some difficulty to uh, come grip with it. Not only the insurance industry, but also regulators. They were talking about AI. We have uh, driverless cars. In the end, it was the flying vehicles. That's the future. How the, the insurance industry cannot keep up because um, they have a huge stable business, you know, this new innovation is a small part of the revenue. So that's why I've been saying that there is a need, especially for Israel, to leapfrog by thinking about the new type of risk management. For example, I would pose the following question to the audience for this group. Can you perform research to come up with an optimal risk management <coughs> contract design. So it's kind of, it doesn't have to be traditional insurance. Maybe it has to be, there's some risk knowledge, awareness, and the risk reduction before just pure uh, insurance transaction. And, and the related question is how the regulators are struggling dealing with AI, you know, now have a digital asset, even currency become digital. They're, they need some help. How can, you know, um, the legal professionals work with the, you know, the other professional financial IT experts to come up with, promote this new way, whether it's tools, and you mentioned about data driven regulation, algorithm driven regulation. But the, the fundamental issue, there's a moral aspect, it has to do good to protect the community, pro protect the public. So uh, based on that you know, principle foundation, how can you develop a new innovative kind of uh, regulation that have some legal effect, a kind of legal power? So that kind of a more wearing a, a kind of academic head here. So uh, any more comments or questions? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, discussion. I have two questions. Can you introduce yourself? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm Elias uh, Kleins from Belgium. I'm teaching in law publications. Um, I have two questions, one on, on the work laws and one on, on loss versus liability insurance. Uh, the first question is just what, what were your thoughts about this work laws defense that is, uh, I think, what topic in that case you were referring to? Is that not something like making a joke, like you said, of, of cyber insurance? Because the rule is that you take a cyber insurance against the risk of cyber attacks, you pay for it, you pay an insurance premium for it, you have a set device 
to take uh, reasonable measures to avoid uh, a cyber attack, and then when a cyber attack uh, comes up, then you get, as I understand, the defensive exclusion of insurance because of the kind of war. Uh, so does it make sense that defense? Uh, papers are full of it, but I don't understand that defense. Um, and then secondly, um, um, I understand that these policies are specialized insurance policies, cyber policies, apart from all kinds of general uh, policies. I can imagine that it has two parts, the loss insurance and liability insurance. Um, and mm -hmm. then I'm asking myself the question, uh, <coughs> liable, that we need to be liable to take or to invoke the liability insurance, mm -hmm. you need to be liable. Um, and so would it be a defense to invoke some kind of force majeure if, if, um, if there is uh, a cyber attack and or any data uh, available of insurance companies that uh, so I'll start um, and just address the, your, your war exclusion question, which I, I is, is, is a good one. And I, I, I actually think I'm kind of of two minds on it, right? Which is to say my answer is it depends. Um, so on the one hand, you know, uh, you know a, an, an attack by a nation state in the context of hostilities against the power grid. That, that feels mm -hmm. different than Mondelez being collateral damage in a, a, an attack on a nuisance attack. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I mean, I, I don't want to <laughs> downplay the, the impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, nuisance okay. sounds, I don't want to minimize it, um, mm -hmm. on, on Ukraine. And I think you know, part of the challenge, is, so one, one issue here is that you know, I mentioned this, this, there's this question about where does the, the you know, a private actor's responsibility and and the governments begin mm -hmm. given that you know that there are aspects of this of, of, of cyber risk that you know are, are, are frankly all hazards right I mean you know like in some sense you know wh wh whether it's you know Trump's 400 pound kid in the basement or you know a Russian GRU officer like you know if they're doing the cyber equivalent of rattling the front door like you know you should be able to defend against that. It shouldn't matter who the who the who the actor is uh, in that discrete case. Um, you know, if you if you look at sort of the history um, of of the war exclusion, I mean, it's interesting. Like, you know, but, I mean, Lloyd's of London, insh like during World War One and thereafter, uh, offered insurance um, in the context of war, and the war exclusion didn't come until like the 1930s, when it, when when accumulate when risk accumulation began to really cause problems for the the insurance industry. And so, in a sense, I mean, it, it's. You know, when you talk to insurance executives, some of them will say, well, it's philosophical, but really at the end of the day, it's about accumulated risk. And so um, it, it, that, that's why I come back to depends. If it's, if, you know, if it's, if it's a, nice, a more isolated incident like Mondelez, different. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about the, the case really, but I mean, it's different than an all out attack against the power grid that, that has, mm. you know, more catastrophic impacts. The other, uh, maybe I'll, I'll add one more point before I turn it over to, to Sean and Asaf is that you know, one of the unique aspects of cyberspace is that you know, it, it, it gives adversaries uh, with relatively low capability a platform for causing a huge amount of damage, hmm. right? And you know, part, I think part of the, the, you know, the, 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 the sort of the theory behind the war exclusion is that you know, nation states have this unique ability to cause harm at mass scale. And that's just not true anymore um, in, in cyberspace, right? Uh, you know, criminal groups, right, can, can, even individual actors in theory have the ability to cause damage that is comparable to what a nation state can achieve. And so it, it complicates the war exclusion, which again is why I, my, my, my kind of glib answer is it depends. Yeah, so I, I thought both your questions were excellent, so I'll take them in turn. I'll uh, on your first question on the war exclusion, uh, first of all, I want to give you the, per the perception that uh, Mandela's v. Zurich is going to be decided one way or the other. There's no one on this panel, I think, who knows how it will be decided. Well, it's going to get settled. It's going to get settled. Well, yeah, well, I agree with that. We'll never know. I <laughs> disagree with that. <laughs> but part of the reason for that is because this is truly a watershed moment for the insurance industry in that it um, highlights some of the 
core classification challenges that, that the industry faces, but also the attribution-based challenges that the industry faces. So the exact wording in the Mondela's Vizuric um, insurance clause, uh, insurance uh, uh, contract, did not only speak about a warlike act, but they spoke about a warlike act by a sovereign entity. And so part of the analysis is also who is a sovereign entity and how do you attribute to a sovereign entity? And so in that case, uh, what um, uh, Zurich is going to provide is a set of intelligence reports provided by the NSA and other Western intelligence agencies saying, well, they all said Russia did it. So that's enough. And uh, uh, the uh, um, insurance uh, evidentiary standard is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, if you're an insurer, the burden is on you to argue for an exclusion. So now the judge will have to decide what is preponderance of the evidence in this context. And what I think is so fascinating, uh, my background is in international law. I worked for the Israel mm. Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for a year. We have been in the international law community talking about attribution in cyberspace for about five, seven years. Mm. And we've been discussing the ILC articles on state responsibility and how to apply them in cyberspace. And, I, and believe it or not, mm -hmm. a judge in a circuit court in Illinois will be the first on the planet to, to debate the evidentiary standards for attribution. And that is terrifying to me. <laughs> and it's not quite true, though. Yeah. But finish your okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, come um, but 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 certainly, so what you're seeing is that there's going to be a lot of questions now being posed, and those the answers to those questions will determine a lot of how this progresses as an exclusionary clause in doing what it's supposed to do, which is to prevent the insurer from taking more than it can chew. As you, I just want to just answer your second point too, uh, and just say that. Um, most of the liability insurance cases that you see in the cyber insurance context are not the kind of ones that you can ever argue force majeure for. That is to say that most of them are about clear breaches of obligations that the insurance company has had. Um, think about Equifax and Uber and the likes. And so it's that kind of liability that is clearly there. And so no force majeure could ever uh, defend uh, Equifax from the kind of behavior that it had. But you wanted to? Yeah. 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 So I. I just, just to maybe complicate yeah. Yeah. Asaf's answer a little bit. So, I mean, courts make decisions about attribution all the time. I mean, that is that is like criminal law and civil liability at it. I mean, that's both both involve those judgments. The question of state responsibility is a little trickier, but um, you know, we in the U.S. I mean, we have all sorts of criminal indictments and, and criminal prosecutions of uh, threat actors um, who. You know, uh, I don't know, wear a PLA uniform. I mean, I don't know, like that that's that's attribution, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, it's it's I don't know. I I'm just I'm, 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 I, I, I think you took that a little yeah. But I will say who Go ahead. No, who, who said <laughs> that the Illinois standards of evidentiary of evidence for for attribution under both tort law or criminal law should be become now because this case has received international um, um, coverage, coverage yeah. would become now what we look at. Uh, even international lawyers will now side back to Mondelez v. Zurich. And we used to talk about it from an international standpoint. I'm pretty sure the judge is not going to look at yeah, all, but any, any case, <laughs> right. any, any case along these lines is going to be decided in a in a private court. I mean, the, the ICJ is not going to hear it. Like, so I mean, yeah. the problem is always going to be decided in. So I, I appreciate the rhetorical point, but like, you know, but yeah, it's a practical matter, it's always going to be decided in private so, court. So, I, we have four minutes, so I don't know if there's any one final <laughs> question that we can take. Um, yeah. Oh. Somebody else. Um, I'm just, I mean, there's a collection, collective action here. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you, you talked about um, the, the need for private, uh, public collaboration. But it seems to me that here we have, you know, because of the externalities, uh, mm. it creates a collective action problem between governments okay. before they even come to the table. Mm. So the question is, how do you think this is going to be? Solved or dealt with, or uh, where you see this going? Um, I think. Sorry. I mean, so far, I, I think the results have not been super encouraging. Um, I think so. Back in um, was it, 2015, uh, you know, there, there was an issue that, that that we led to to identify a series of, of, of peacetime norms 
of behavior in cyberspace. And they included things like, you know, don't attack critical infrastructure, don't engage in cyber enabled industrial espionage. And uh, you know, the G20 agreed to them, uh, including China. Um, but those are, you know, fragile. Um, earlier this year, you know, governments um, in Prague agreed to a series of, of principles around 5G um, that, uh, you know, kind of gesture in, in this direction. Um, that was, I think, a pretty, a pretty big deal, but it took a lot of effort and, uh, you know, and I just, you know, the, the political moment we're in, uh, uh, the United States, uh, within Europe with, with Brexit and, you know, and, and just, you know, the, the divisions within Europe over, um, you know, how to deal with, how to, you know, uh, deal with China, with Russia and others, it just makes, makes all, make, makes the diplomatic side of this really, really challenging and I, I think we're, we're sort of in for a period of time when um, I'm kind of bearish on, on the prospects, um, at least, you know, I'd say the next three to five years. What I will just point out, in the last two days in the conference that um, uh, the Federal Cyber Security Research Center and the uh, Israel National Cyber Directorate had, had uh, co-organized, uh, we had regulators from uh, France and Germany and the United States all present in the room. And that is in part because of um, an attempt that it is in this space. So one, for example, one solution that the Israeli National Cyber Directorate has been kind of throwing in the air is the idea of an international backstop. So a common topic for discussion in the cyber trend space is the need for a governmental backstop. That is, for example, you see it in the terrorism context after 9-11, all the insurers did not want to provide any terrorism insurance anymore because they were worried about aggregated costs after what they endured in 9-11. And so the government of many countries stepped in to say, we will legislate laws that will, after a certain amount of harm is introduced, we will step in as your reinsurer, the insurance industry, and we will provide you additional funds so to ensure that there's always money in the pot and no one go, goes insolvent. Um, one of the challenges in this context is, is it really smart to do nation-based backstop? Uh, or is there room for thinking about regional backstops or even international backstops? That's kind of international funds, uh, international pools. And that is one thing that the Israeli National Cyber Director is now thinking about with international partners. But I completely agree with Andrew's point from before that everything concerning cybersecurity and cyberspace is mirrored with um, um, suspicion and concern, and so international diplomacy is one huge challenge in this space. I think we run out of time, but what I do hope to have been able to persuade you is just how invigorating discussions on cyber insurance really are, and that you should all teach insurance law and then uh, do special sessions on cyber insurance, because it's true, it's so great. Okay. We, we, have a, we have a joke uh, <laughs> in, in American cyber policy circles that Offensive cyber operations are for amateurs. Pros talk about insurance. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so, that's a good one. <laughs> so with that, we will end. Okay. There's 30 minutes for coffee okay. break. Is that right? Okay. So that's what we have. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. That's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. Good job. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.